Um, you, you get all excited. You just see colored pencils when you start like, oh, this is going to be so much fun. You take your script, you lay it all out in front of you, you go through into it. Space. Or now today, you go into your EP scheduling software and you have a cup of coffee and your computer and whatever music you like playing in the background and you just go through and start marking up the script. And that you're doing electronic. You're highlighting, you know, you're taking your cursor and you're highlighting word and you're calling it a prop and then your font turns purple or the font turns, you know, brown, whatever if it sounds and you just go through that entire process. Well, Sarah, are we recording again? Yeah. Okay. All right, so now, because this is not written in and this is why we want correct screenplay format, because it, it, make, it makes everything unorganized when we don't do it. This is where we understand it's a technical document. So it should be, except Joel Barish, caps, comma, 35, comma, hold to bright red, da 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 da. So now, we, because we're really good ADs and we're really sharp, and even though we're rolling our eyes at the screenwriter, because he just made our life difficult, it's a good thing we caught this so that we don't have an extra come on and do this role. And then when we go to film it, we, we are not understanding. We take it to the edit room and we go, wait a minute. Why are we editing in some random guy with a heart-shaped box and later we have the main character doing that same thing? Like, this isn't making sense now. So we are all going to right now underline one commuter in red and we're going to underline Joel Barish in red, and we're going to draw a line across so that we know this is the same person. So a line from one, yep, to the other. Going right across the action line, the action lines. So yep. And then do one commuter in red. Yep, <clears throat> and then do Joel Barish in red. Oh, yeah. And then draw a line between those two things, right across oh, the text. Right across. across the text, yep, we have to be very clear this is the same character. This is the same person. Okay. Yes. Exactly. So we wait a minute. We skip the. We're going to go back to it. Oh, okay. Yeah. The reason that we knew to do that, again, the way we knew, knew to do that is we read this script once without marking up anything. We just read the script once and just read it said, oh, this is the script, da, 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 da. what a nice, lovely screenplay. Joel is the main character. Then we come read this, now we break down the script and we go, wait a minute, Joel is the same guy as that one commuter. So we know that we caught that. But if this were written in correct screenplay format, we would be tight. Because we, we, the lesser AD might not catch that. And then we have a problem. So why don't, you know, this is a technical document. So as screenwriters, it's a technical document, we have to look at it that way. People are going to come and approach this technically. All right, so let's keep going. So let's have uh, Alex. You'll, we'll, we'll let Aiden off. Thank you for reading, Aiden. And Alex, start with the platform across the tracks is empty. Uh, the platform across the tracks is empty as an almost or as an empty as an almost empty train pulls up to that platform. One of the student men breaks out of the crowd, lurches up the stairs two at a time, hurries across the overpass and down the stairs to the other side, just as the empty train stops. Okay, hold. So we have a few things to mark up. <coughs> The platform across the tracks is empty. So that, remember how I said, if they say the restaurant is empty, we know, don't put extras there. So he's telling us, we're not gonna put extras across the platform, it's empty. Then he says, as an almost empty plant train pulls up. Again, empty train, we won't put extras on that train. The train, we need to mark. As we see on our list, we mark vehicles in pink. So grab your pink pencil and underline train. It's a vehicle. Notice animals are also underlined in pink. This is another throwback to the early 18th, 19th century, 20th century. The early 20th century when vehicles and animals were in fact one and the same. You might ride a horse. There were still buggy oh, carriages yeah. at that time period. So this is why animals fall into the pink category. A lot of people are like, why? Why do animals fall into pink? Oh, you know why? Because they need like they need to be caretaken. Just like for the for a vehicle that comes on set, you need to have it like, you know, in a garage, you need to have someone drive it. You know, if you have a pig come on set, it needs to be like in a pen, it needs to da, 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 da. it's just historic. That when this process began, the horse buggy could be the vehicle. Doesn't matter what animal now. Back then it usually was horses, horse and buggy. 
So that's why they were going vehicle slash animal. So they used to be one and the same. Now we've got pigs, we've got this, we've got that. We don't have horses as vehicles unless we're doing a period piece. So, but we still use the same color for both of them. So if there was a dog in the sea, we would still underline it in pink. If there was a goldfish in the sea, we underline it in pink. What if the animal is the main character of the film? Oh, well then if it's a speaking role, he's underlined in red. Like Mr. Red. Right. Animal, but he's talking. Well, no, he doesn't actually have lines. Mr. Red just makes noises. Doesn't he? No, he's a talking horse. Does he actually talk like he says, hello, Wilbur, tomorrow we're going to go oh, over. Just, no, you see what I mean? Yeah, he just makes sounds. He just is like, you know? Yeah, still color <laughs> so he would be, he would just be pink. Mr. Red would just be pink. If he actually said, hello, Wilbur, we're going to go over to the store tomorrow, and then after we go to the store, we have to go check out that girl she wanted to go on a date, and I said we could double, so you're going to be with the owner and I'll be with the horse, you know, it's, if he were doing that, then he would be underlined in red. But Mr. Red does it. Same thing with Lassie. Lassie's underlined in pink. Lassie just goes, burr, 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 and they go, what, boy? What? You said that she's under the well, you know, behind the mine that blew up and exploded. You know, Billy, Billy was his name, right? He's very fluent in canines. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why is Lassie Queen she was the main character? Because she's, a, she, she's an animal. She doesn't speak. Uh -huh. Now, Babe, the film the pig, with the pig, right. in that one, that's red. Because yeah, okay. Babe speaks. I want. I don't want to be a dog. I mean, I want to be a dog. I don't want to be a pig. Da, 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 da. But that's not Babe speaking. What did Babe actually speak? Yeah, no. that's what I thought. Yeah, I thought Babe yeah, had lines. About. Yeah, Babe had yeah. lines. He talks to the sheep and stuff. Remember? Yeah. That's how he gets them on his side. He asks them nicely. That's a cartoon. No, no, it was live action, action. But they the they put in a voiceover. It. Oh, that's what I'm okay. That's what they do with Mr. Ray. They put in a voiceover. Like. Mr. Red actually says things. Right, Mr. Red, hey, Mr. Red talked to Wilbur. He, when it was a voice, so it wasn't actually the horse talking, but it was a voice. But the over. character, the, the, oh, what, then he would be Red. Oh, if about, if Mr. Red actually. Huh? Oh, Charlotte's Red? No, 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 no he's telling the horse. Show. If Mr. Horse, I thought Mr. Red just did like. No, that, he had or he, or he whatever. Talk. No, he talked. He would oh. actually say, hello, Wilbur. Right, so let's do it again, Wilbur. Okay, then yeah, he'd be Red. Then yes, he would be Red. Yes, red. Yep. Because that's still kind of the dialogue, right? Yes. Okay. The distinction is we do not have to hire an actor to do Lassie's voice. We have to hire an actor to do Mr. Red's voice. We have to hire an actor to do a voice the thoughts in their head. So anytime they're speaking, they actually have their character, they have a character here and they have dialogue. Even if that dialogue is voiceover, we need to hire we need to cast that. But Lassie, it just says wolf, wolf, wolf. This is Lassie barks. And we don't we don't need to bring someone in to go into our ADR room and record that. In the screenplay, do they actually have like Lassie and then bark bark? They no, no. They just have Lassie barks in action line. Mm -hmm. If we had Lassie and dialogue with Wolf Wolf Wolf, then we would need to get an actress. She would need to come in and go Wolf 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 Wolf. You know, we need to have her perform it and actually do it. That's why we only want to reserve the character and the dialogue element for lines that we want someone coming in and recording. And we don't want them coming in and recording. And that's the same thing where it said, Joel talks, but we didn't know whether that means he speaks yet. He does not have lines yet. So you might have a character, you might say in the background, the judge and the lawyer talk, but you never give them lines. We never need to mic them. We never need to record their voice. They just need to be standing in the background talking. So that's the difference, okay? So let's keep going. So now we have, again, we have this, we have just underlined the train in pink. And we have again where it says one of the suited men breaks out of the crowd, lurches up the stairs, two at a time, hurries across the platform. One of the suited men, we have read this script, so we know this is Joel. Do you see how problematic it is to not call him by his character name the very first time he appears? We underline him in red again. We underline one of the suited men, underline that in red, and draw a line to Joel again. So that we know, no, this isn't a silent role. This is still that same actor. Okay. Draw the line. 
time to Joel, because it's the same person. We know that because we've read the script one time through. Now we're going, oh, Charlie Kaufman, why won't you write in screenplay format? But we love the film so much, we love the screenplay so much that we go, fine, maybe on the next movie. Maybe we'll hire a writer's assistant, and the writer's assistant can go through and clean up this formula. He's such a fantastic writer. Okay, so now we have where it says, one of the suited men breaks out of the crowd, lurches up the stairs two at a time, hurries across the overpass, and down the steps to the other side. This is a stunt. We underline it in orange. As we can see in our breakdown, in our directions on how to break down a script, it says underline it in orange. Now, if you have someone jump roping, that's a stunt. Obviously, our easy stunts are someone's doing, Allison, you have stunts in your script. We have a lot of combat scenes. So we have, so you're gonna have a lot of places where you're underlining stunts. So we were underlining lurches up the stairs, coming up the stairs two at two at a time, hurrying across the over pad down the down the stairs to the other side. That's correct. Right. That's all, all that's, that's correct. Action. All of that is action. It starts at lurches up the stairs or breaks out of the crowd. Lurches up the stairs. Bradley, you have action in your screenplay. You have the entire scene in the hotel where the characters are chasing each other. This is action. This is stunts. Sorry, sorry. This is stunts. We want to underline these stunts. You have someone fire a gun off and hits the other person. Aiden, in your script, we have the stunt when the fire, when he shoots, um, when he's coming down the steps with a knife. One of the characters has a knife. The other character has a gun. This is after they leave Caleb's room. All of, the, all of that are stunts. Even characters dancing are stunts. Characters jump roping are stunts. If a character trips, that's a stunt. So the more action they do, they're doing that. Anytime they're doing something other than walking, walking. pretty much. Right. <laughs> we trust an actor does not need someone on standby as he walks. Now, if he trips, we may need someone on standby. Because depending on how this trip is, we don't want to, we actually kind of want the actor, actors know, they actually take courses, there's stage combat courses they take. There's, there's obviously dance that actors take. But there's also stunt coordination classes that actors take. So even just learning how to fall, actors know how to fall. They know how to fall in a way where it looks believable and they don't hurt themselves. That's something from stage actors or screen actors, they all learn how to do. Different ones of them become more involved in it. Tom Cruise does some of his stunts himself. For him, preparing for a role is not the same as preparing for a role that Robert De Niro goes through. Robert De Niro goes through a process of understanding the background of his character, the interior wants and desires of his character, why his character might have felt this way from a childhood, who his parents were. You know, he is, he, his method comes from Strasbourg. So Spielberg, I mean, uh, De Niro is going through, and then he's going through it, correlating that with his own life. Where in his own life he has he had these experiences and can understand this. Tom Cruise, when he prepares for a role, he goes to a gym and starts tumbling on mats. That's how he prepares for a role. He starts learning, am I gonna turn the cross over here? He does kickbox training. He goes, I could punch Allison like this, and if the camera's over here, no one would see my, that I don't make contact. But I could also do this, and that allows me to get in a little bit tighter, so the camera shot can be a little bit closer, and we can actually execute that. This is something that actors do. Different actors choose which one is more exciting for them and which ones they're better at. So, but this is all how the actor prepares. You still want, as they have learned how to do this stunt, you still want someone on standby that in case they, they a trip could cause a sprained ankle. An actor with a sprained ankle could mean you have two days of shooting that you don't, that you can't shoot. Because he's hopping around on a sprained ankle. And even if he goes, I can do the scene with, with it, I will, you still might have him. And that's not part of the character. The character does not have a sprained ankle. So we cannot capture that on scene. So if you'd rather have someone, when you underline things in stunts, we now have a list that goes and says we need a stunt coordinator, and this is a list of all the stunts this coordinator needs to be aware of. So even on the simplest stunt, you want someone present. Like I said, if it's a jump rope, you still want someone present because you can get tangled up in that jump rope and you can fall. And you can sprain your ankle and then we're in trouble. Okay? So stunts are underlined. Um, Max, keep going, starting from, um, just as the empty train stops, the next sentence. 
the door is open and the man gets on the train. Or no, sorry, the empty train. No, you're right. Oh yeah, the empty train pulls from the station. The man watches the crowd of commuters through the train's dirty window. We see his face for the first time. This is Joel Barish. He is in his 30s, sallow, a bit puffy. His hair is a little messy. His suit is either vintage or just old and dirty. It's sort of threadbare. His bright tie has a photograph of a rodeo printed on it. Yeah. So now for the um, the empty train pulls up to the station, he watches the crowd of commuters through the dirty window. We want to make note of that. We'll just make note of it by underlining it in pink. We'll keep it in that it's that it's vehicle, that it's something about that vehicle. The vehicle also has doors that open. We'll underline that in pink as well. So that when we go and get this train, we know that what we call, you know, the what is this, the Long Island Railroad, Wesley, the Montauk station? Yeah. So when we call the Long Island Railroad and say, we're shooting, can we get a train, da da da, they go, yeah, we've got a train that's out of commission. We go, okay, great, we know to go. You know what, do, do the doors, are the doors still functioning? And they go, oh no, that train, we steal those doors, they're locked, they can't, they, or, well, we're not gonna run power, so you're not gonna, they need power to open the doors. So you need to open the doors? Yeah, on set, we're gonna need to open the doors when we're filming. Oh, so then we'll get you a train that we can run power to, and you can open the doors. So we need to mark that, and then we need to just mark that it's dirty, so our art department knows we need to make sure the window, put, you know, the art department will make sure it's dirty. Yes, Bradley. So, in pink, we're underlining train, dirty window? That's right. And doors open? And doors open. Okay. Because these are all just notes that are part of the vehicle. Just the doors open. No. Again, it's just like props. You just underline it once so that we only end up with one of them. If we underline it two times, we end up with two trains. That's why it had to be the same color, too. Right. right. Yeah. Now the other part that um, Max read, he is in his 30s, sallow, a bit puffy. That's makeup. Makeup is identified with an asterisk. So you'll just take your black pencil or you'll take your lead pencil. It's stronger to do it with your lead pencil. Grab your lead pencil and just write an asterisk right where it says sallow, a bit puffy. His hair is a little messy. This is hair, hair and makeup, asterisk. So where it says his hair, we'll write asterisk right there. His suit is either vintage. This is wardrobe. So we're gonna circle that with our black pencil. His bright tie has a photograph of a rodeo printed on it, wardrobe, and we circle it. How much do you circle about the suit? Usually that it's vintage. We don't have to get into red bear because vintage is uh, old and dirty. I'll circle red bear. The suit is vintage. Yes, that's oh. right. That we circle in black. So where it says in bright tie, you do all of that you, you want it. And the bright tie has a photograph of a rodeo printer on it. You circle all of that or just yes. uh, we circle course. all of it. Okay. Yep. Every time you finish with a script, it's got lines everywhere. Huh? Yes. That's why we call it marked up. We mark up the script. It's going to be so color coded by the time this is done. Written, handwritten, all kinds of stuff on it. This is dissecting it. We're breaking the script down into its smallest components. It's kind of anytime you have a big task in front of you, break it down. You do each small piece, and then before you know it, the entire thing is completed. Oh, well, it's, it, it's only it's only the AD. And, and so it's only you, and as your producer, well, you'll see the second step, what happens. This is only the AD who sees this, or the producer is the only person who sees it. All right, so now we've already done scene two, so we'll go ahead and go to scene three. Allison, read scene three. Exterior beach day. Joel wanders the windy, empty beach with his briefcase. He passes an old man with a metal detector. They nod at each other. What are we marking up here? Briefcase. Yes. Yep, that's right. Briefcase. Old man, metal detector. Yes. What color is old man? Uh, yellow. That's yeah, correct. Yellow. What color is metal detector and briefcase? Green. 
this side. Right, exactly. Right side, right? Exactly. You just bracket the one side. I have an eraser if you want. I got one on the side. Okay. Is it good? Is it working yeah. well? Sometimes color pencil. Sometimes color pencil needs a stronger eraser. Okay. Uh, 